Um, I'm delighted um, to welcome you uh, to the Mc McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and the Institute of Politics um, lecture in the health reform series. Um, uh, as you know, it's a year-long series um, that uh, started last week uh, with David Axelrod talking about the politics of health reform and continues today uh, with Dr. Mark McClellan. Uh, I want to again thank the Institute of Politics. Uh, I see some of the representatives here uh, for their help in co-sponsoring this event. Uh, I, I, before I introduce Dr. McClellan, I, I just want to give you a very brief um, uh, preview of two upcoming events. Uh, next week in, in this series, Casey Mulligan, a professor of economics here at the University of Chicago, will talk about the Affordable Care Act and the labor market. Uh, tomorrow evening at the Bowman Society Lectures, uh, a lecture series uh, named for a late and distinguished faculty member in the Department of Medicine and one of my original teachers here at the University of Chicago, Dr. Jim Bowman. Uh, tomorrow's Bowman lecture uh, will feature Daniel Dawes. Uh, Mr. Dawes is the Executive Director of Government Relations and Health Policy at the Morehouse School of Medicine. And Mr. Dawes will be speaking tomorrow on health care reform and the role of the ACA in addressing health disparities and promoting health equity. The lecture will be from 5.30 to 6.30 in the DCAM building on the fourth floor atrium. Uh, for more information about the Bowman Lecture, uh, please pick up a flyer from the table uh, on your way out. Uh, all of you interested in health reform might find Mr. Dawes' lecture particularly useful. And, and now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Mark McClellan, whose flight from uh, Washington, D.C. was delayed for a medical emergency, uh, in which I'm happy to report uh, Dr. McClellan uh, became involved. D Dr. McClellan earned his MD from the Harvard-MIT Division of Health Sciences and his PhD in economics from MIT. He completed residency training in internal medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, I think it's that rich background that enabled him to recognize today's problem and to address it. Uh, Dr. McClellan is the director of the Engelberg Center for Healthcare Reform and holds the Leonard Schaefer Chair in Health Policy uh, at the Brookings Institution in Washington. Dr. McClellan also is co-director of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Leaders Project on the State of American Healthcare and is a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies of Science. From 2001 to 2002, Dr. McClellan served as a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors and as Senior Director for Healthcare Policy at the White House under President George W. Bush. From 2002 to 2004, Dr. McClellan was the Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. And from 2004 to 2006, he served as Director of CMS. Um, in these leadership roles, Dr. McClellan developed and implemented many major reforms in health policy. They include S-CHIP, the State Children's Health Insurance Program, and the FDA's Critical Path Initiative. Today, as part of our series, Dr. McClellan's topic is Next Steps for Healthcare Reform. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Awesome. Mark McClellan. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you all very much. It's a real privilege to be here uh, with you all today and to be part of this distinguished uh, uh, seminar series. I understand from Dr. Siegel that it's now 50 years uh, just about since he's been at the University of Chicago and the seminar series has been a 
fixture for much of that time, so I'm uh, very pleased to be a part of it, especially on such a timely set of issues as the series is addressing this year. Uh, last week you got to hear about, uh, the, I think, the politics uh, around the Affordable Care Act. Next week you're going to hear about some of the economics. I'm going to try to fit in between uh, those topics with uh, covering both some of the uh, some economic issues, some political issues, but, but mainly focusing on uh, something I think is very important to all of you uh, uh, healthcare professionals in this room, and that is the, uh, the opportunity and the need for leadership for further steps to make sure our steps on healthcare reform, our policies on healthcare reform, actually have the intended effects. I did have a delayed flight this morning, uh, fortunately for the patient involved. The emergency happened right before we took off, not afterwards, but uh, I remember um, as I was uh, sitting there trying to, to help uh, with the response to that with one other physician who happened to be on board, just how long of a way we have to go. His wife was looking on, a uh, person wasn't responsive, just how long of a way we have to go in still solving these problems. So uh, again, thanks for the opportunity to be here with you today while we uh, uh, talk about the intersection between what healthcare policy is trying to do and healthcare reform is trying to do and what ultimately comes down to uh, the role of health professionals in working with the public in this country and actually getting to better health. So I'm going to cover four topics, the healthcare reform and healthcare fundamentals, some of what I see as the, uh, the big drivers in the, the, the politics of the moment uh, and the, the policy debates of the moment uh, in health policy. Uh, then uh, spend a, a bit of time on what's uh, my take on what's going on now uh, with the implementation of the ACA and some other current issues uh, in Washington where uh, the government has shut down uh, essentially over a, a debate about the, the future of healthcare reform in the United States. Uh, and then I want to spend most of my time talking about this third topic, uh, steps towards uh, transforming care to what I would call real healthcare reform, which is not something that's possible just by expanding insurance coverage, trying to lower prices, as important as those steps might be, uh, but uh, to actually changing the way that, that healthcare is delivered to get to better health and lower cost, which I think is the only sustainable path. For, for this country. So in terms of fundamentals, there are really two. There's cost and, uh, uh, and quality and access uh, on, on the other hand. Uh, this is a chart that I think some of you may have seen before that highlights the important role of healthcare spending in uh, our nation's current fiscal crisis and more generally uh, the current role uh, of healthcare in the problems facing state governments, uh, problems facing uh, businesses and households in terms of rising healthcare costs. The chart divides federal spending of all types into three categories. There's the blue, that's spending on Social Security programs started in 1965. The red is uh, health, the health care entitlement, so that's Medicare, Medicaid, and the new subsidies for insurance coverage under the ACA. And the, the light blue uh, at the top is everything else that the federal government spends money on. So uh, uh, national defense, uh, infrastructure, research and development, education programs, uh, low income assistance programs, everything else. The chart runs from 1973 uh, out to near 2040, uh, that big blip in the light blue in the middle was the Great Recession of 2008. You see uh, upturns in uh, the so-called non-defense uh, uh, discretionary spending uh, in periods of economic downturn. We're on the back side of that right now uh, as a result of the stimulus funding ending and further steps that the federal government has taken to uh, reduce federal outlays. Uh, but aside from those uh, uh, bumps up with recessions, uh, the big story over 40 years has been uh, rising health care spending as a share of GDP. That's the vertical axis. So going from from uh, around a couple of percent of GDP in the 70s uh, to uh, over 6% uh, uh, today and on track to increase by another uh, three percentage points over the next 20 years or so as the baby boom retires, more people go into uh, public programs and as uh, we expect healthcare costs to continue to increase. This is with the recent slowdown in spending growth already built in. So security is contributing a bit to the long-term fiscal pressures facing the United States. It's about 1% more of GDP over the retirement of the baby boom. But the big story, as you can see from this chart, now and in the past and in the future, really is the, the growth in healthcare spending. So this is the spending side of the, the cost challenge.
challenges facing our country. Um, same kind of chart uh, applies at the, the state level. This is uh, trends in state expenditures on um, Medicaid versus uh, K-12 education uh, over time. Uh, the last year for which we got complete data, 2012 versus 2011, uh, uh, as part of that same ongoing trend, uh, increases in Medicaid spending and pretty much reductions in everything else uh, that states spend money on uh, overall. So uh, th this is a, a, the big issue uh, in terms of the, the, the national uh, and state fiscal outlook and same thing contributing to limited growth in take home wages for American workers as their health care costs have gone up. Now, many of you have probably seen these kinds of numbers, but there is a flip side to this too. Uh, at the same time as we've been spending more on uh, health care, we've also seen some notable improvements in health outcomes for the population. You all who are involved in medicine know that just about every condition uh, is treated significantly differently and significantly better than it was years ago. And there have been actually a number of economic studies on this, including uh, some uh, very uh, uh, widely recognized studies by uh, professors from right here at the University of Chicago on the benefits versus the cost of this spent increase in spending on health care over time. Uh, what this chart shows is ratios of, uh, uh, based on reasonable valuations of the uh, increases in length of life that had happened for uh, a range of conditions. These studies generally don't even get into quality of life issues, which also, if you look at trends uh, for many illnesses, have improved. Uh, less time spent in the hospital, uh, more time spent uh, if you have heart failure with a higher level of activity, uh, if you've got uh, uh, non-fatal but still debilitating conditions like uh, arthritis, uh, substantial improvements in functionality and quality of life over time, all of which are very valuable. And the bottom line from all this is that the, the cost versus the benefit benefits don't even come close. Uh, according to that uh, Chicago study that I mentioned by uh, Kevin Murphy and Bob Topel, uh, they viewed the improvements in longevity alone that have happened over the last 50 years in the United States as a result of uh, improved biomedical knowledge, which again, it's not all changes in medical technology, not just the, uh, the advent of aspirin uh, use for, for heart attacks and CCUs and uh, beta blockers and so forth, although those contributed, but biomedical knowledge overall, it's not even close. So uh, the improvements that have happened in healthcare from greater biomedical knowledge uh, outweigh in terms of value the improvements in every other sector of the economy combined. So it's great to have iPods and uh, jet travel and, and lots of cable stations, but what people really enjoy is the time to use all those things as well as sunsets and more time with family members, loved ones, their mom. Uh, it's tremendously valuable. And this is kind of the rock and the hard place that's behind why healthcare politics uh, I think are so difficult. Uh, what the American public has consistently shown over the last 40 years uh, is that when push comes to shove and there's a choice between spending uh, on health care programs versus spending on just about everything else, health care spending wins. Why? Because I think of just what, of what I just told you, how important it is uh, for the, their quality and, and length of life and, and how much they, they know that. And this is not to say that there aren't opportunities for real improvements in health care. I'll get to those in a minute. Uh, but this is why it is such an important an issue, and this is why it's so important, uh, especially for those of you who are involved in, in medicine, uh, to, to help us find a way forward to address both the concerns of the American public about the benefits that continued improvements in healthcare and medical technology and biomedical knowledge can bring to them, on the one hand, uh, versus the, uh, the, the um, uh, scarce resources available for, for other things on the other. Um, people have made a lot of, uh, paid a lot of attention in the past year to the so-called sequestration that's in effect for the federal budget now, which essentially has uh, retained most of Medicare spending growth, all of Medicaid uh, spending growth at the expense of squeezing down everything else in the federal government. Uh, so that's what's accounting for this most recent uh, decline in the light blue part up there and the continued increase uh, uh, in uh, uh, the health care entitlements. But what I want you to take away from this chart is that that is absolutely not a new phenomenon. It has been going on consistently in American politics and decisions by uh, Congress, President, uh, leadership of both parties for now 40 years steadily. So uh, that brings us to the current health care reform issues where uh, the, uh, the role of the ACA is obviously playing a central role in the current uh, shutdown of the federal government, um, the debate over continuing, uh, uh, continuing resolution for funding the, the, the federal budget uh, as well as the federal debt limit. Um, I've been predicting for a while that uh, we were going to have a, I've been right about this so far, I predicted that we'd have a short-term government shutdown over uh, this being such an important issue. I think I'm about to be wrong because the uh, shutdown is uh, now 
continuing uh, out into a uh, longer time period with not really any resolution in sight. And again, it's, uh, it's really around uh, how to deal with the, these rising costs on the one hand versus uh, the concerns that the public has about access to high quality care uh, on the other. Um, as I said, this is not a new phenomenon. We did it in 2011, we did it in 2012, as the President pointed out in his uh, press conference yesterday. In every single case, it's been the pressure from rising health care costs that's the main contributor uh, to this very tight uh, situation with the nation's fiscal outlook. And I think correctly, many people are predicting at this point that we're going to keep doing this. Maybe we'll find a short-term way through the, uh, the current government shutdown. Maybe we'll find a, a way to increase the debt limit for another uh, year or so. Uh, but we will probably keep doing this over and over and over again until we are able to get to a, a broader uh, kind of grand bargain that deals both with the federal deficit outlook, which again is primarily driven by rising health care costs uh, and the uh, health care entitlements, uh, and deals with uh, um, uh, 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 getting to more of a national consensus about just how much the federal government should be spending uh, on all of its activities, particularly the, uh, the increases in, in health care costs. Against the backdrop of all this, uh, the Affordable Care Act is being implemented right now. Um, a lot of people are asking me these days since I was at CMS in 2005-2006 uh, with the implementation of Medicare Part D, kind of the last big uh, uh, government program expansion, uh, how does this compare? And I think the, 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 the main difference is that this is going to be a more gradual process. So uh, when um, uh, Medicare Part D started in, in late 2005 with uh, uh, a website uh, getting up and running and then uh, enrollment at the beginning of January, um, a very large number of Medicare beneficiaries switched over from their previous drug coverage to current Medicare Part D. So on January 1, 2006, there were 7.5 million dual eligible Medicare Medicaid beneficiaries who switched into coverage, plus millions more beneficiaries who previously be getting coverage through Medigap or somewhere else. Uh, we had our biggest implementation challenges right around then. Uh, even if our systems were working well to keep up to date with who was enrolled in what plan and uh, what they were eligible for and so forth, even if they worked well 99% of the time, 1% times 10 million beneficiaries is still a huge number, especially when it comes to prescription drugs, which you know people need to take on a, on a regular basis to prevent, uh, especially Medicaid beneficiaries of multiple chronic conditions, need to take to prevent uh, serious complications. Uh, but after we got through those initial startup uh, issues around the beginning of January, by the end of March, the vast majority of Medicare beneficiaries were in Part D coverage, and the program has pretty much continued, actually expanded uh, a bit since then. Same was true when Medicare was established in 1965. Uh, some rocky issues with the initial startup, but the program was pretty well established with most people enrolled by early uh, 1966. That is not going to be the case here. Um, as you know, uh, many states are uh, have chosen not to expand Medicaid, at least yet. Uh, the, the states in uh, kind of the medium blue on this map or ones that are uh, not have not yet approved expansions but are planning to. This is very much like what happened when Medicaid was established in 1965. About half the state started coverage right away and then there was a tail out afterwards with the last state uh, expanding coverage in anybody know what year? 1982, so it's a pretty long tail then. Um, uh, similarly for the state children's health insurance program in the 1990s, half of the states or so right away, tail out after that. Um, there's a lot of overlap between the states that are running their own exchanges versus states that have uh, opted to have nothing to do with the federal implementation uh, of the program. And I think a sign that you'll look for to see when this program is really becoming uh, better stabilized and more established is when some more of the, the light blue states in this chart uh, decide that they want to take over for the federal government in running their exchanges because they can do it better and, uh, and frankly because uh, a lot of the startup issues that uh, uh, have made some, uh, especially Republicans, Republican governors not want to get too close to this program. A lot of those bumpy startup issues will uh, will be behind us. I'm not sure uh, uh, how and when that will happen. We can maybe come back to that in the discussion. Uh, but it's probably going to be at least a couple of years from now. If you look at the, the administration's own projections about enrollment uh, in the ACA, about 7 million people in exchanges in the first year. As you all know, that's a fraction uh, of the number of Americans who are uninsured. Uh, so this is going to take a, a bit of time to sort out, like on the order of several years uh, at least. Um, there are uh, 
some issues to watch now. I'm not going to spend much time on this. I think you've covered the ACA some last week. You're going to cover it more next week. I'm going to talk about some big picture issues. Uh, but uh, right now, we're working through the outreach and enrollment support systems. Um, and uh, uh, there will be a, a process for, for working through those. Uh, um, I think, uh, unfortunately, for the administration, they're still kind of on the, the, the first round of, uh, uh, of access issues on the exchanges. But they do have time to, to work through that in the coming weeks. Um, then uh, you're likely to see some variation across states in how much uh, uh, enrollment there is uh, in, in uh, plans. Also, probably some stories coming up in November and December about people who, uh, remember, there are about 7 million people expected to enroll in the exchanges. They're kind of a comparable number, actually slightly larger number, who are in individual insurance coverage now or in uh, the, the small number of small businesses that actually offer insurance coverage. Uh, some of them are going to be significantly better off under this program. Some of them will be uh, will face higher premiums, especially younger and, and healthier uh, workers and small firms. So there'll be some stories about that. Uh, then come January, uh, issues around how well this coverage is actually working. Again, this is where we had a difficult time in Medicare Part D. Uh, this will be easier for uh, the administration because there are not going to be so many people shifting such critical coverage at one time immediately at the beginning of January. It's going to be a more gradual process than that. Many of the people who are getting coverage now haven't had it before. Uh, and uh, they'll certainly want to use it starting early in 2014, but uh, it won't be quite the same thing as needing to get seven prescriptions filled that day uh, in order to keep their uh, current conditions stable. Uh, they, they won't have, there won't be that big of a, of a burst, so that'll probably be a bit uh, uh, easier. Uh, there will be some questions about, um, uh, given the, the, the formularies and the size of the, the networks of providers uh, in some of the plans that look like are going to be the, the lowest cost plans and going to be the most popular, uh, uh, how well uh, uh, those will go over. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, access and quality of care. Uh, but uh, again, these are all issues that are, that are manageable. Uh, I think that the biggest challenge, and I'll come back to this if I have time at the end, is going to be around um, in, in adverse selection. Uh, is the, the penalty really enough to, to drive up a big spike in enrollment uh, in uh, March before the open enrollment period ends? Uh, with, again, with Medicare Part D, uh, we did have a, a big surge in enrollment among relatively healthy seniors in you know, the end of the open enrollment period in, two, in early 2006, uh, because uh, I think they basically believe, well, first of all, it's going to be sort of the social norm to, to, to get into Medicare Part D. Uh, and then second, uh, they really did care about the penalty. It's a significant penalty like Medicare Part B. You pay 10% more for the rest of your life uh, if you don't sign up the first time that you're eligible. And that gets bigger and bigger the longer you wait. So people signed up. This penalty is not going to be as large. Uh, there may be some, because of, again, some bumps around this initial uh, implementation, what will be a gradual several year process, uh, this issue of adverse selection. May, uh, uh, may be around for a while, too. So uh, we, we obviously haven't, we were obviously making uh, some, there's some very important decisions and issues uh, going on right now in terms of, of health care reform. Uh, but uh, it's playing against this backdrop of, on the one hand, uh, concerns about rising costs and access to care, uh, but on the other hand, uh, assuring that uh, the, the care that is provided is, is high quality. Uh, and so uh, sort of the traditional way, and this is a bit of an oversimplification, uh, uh, but uh, I want to use it to illustrate some, some points about what I think is going to be important in the future of health care reform. Uh, the traditional way of trying to control uh, these rising costs has been to squeeze payment rates. And for all of you who are health care providers, you know how this works. This is uh, what was the, the mainstay of uh, the so-called scored savings and the, uh, the last time uh, we had a grand bargain to try to reduce uh, the, the federal deficit outlook. Uh, that was in 1990 with the Balanced Budget Act. Uh, it was the main source of the savings used to offset the cost of the coverage expansions under the ACA, about a trillion dollars worth, uh, and that is to squeeze down payment rates in public programs, particularly Medicare. So uh, the new normal uh, in Medicare post-ACA is uh, an increase in payments for providers uh, that's a little bit less than the, the overall uh, uh, measured cost of inflation, around 1.1 percent or thereabouts, a little more, a little less. 1.1 percent may not seem like much, but over time through the miracle of compound interest, it adds up to a lot, adds up to a trillion dollars uh, over 10 years. This is why um, some of the um, uh, Medicare actuaries have uh, expressed uh, uh, skepticism that um, that, that, that cumulative uh, impact on squeezing prices will be sustained. After all, they say, look at what's happened with physician payment, where uh, back in the, the last budget uh, uh, savings effort uh, brought uh, the, the sustainable growth rate 
which uh, uh, for next year is scheduled to lead to a 25% reduction in physician payments. That's almost certainly not going to happen. Uh, uh, who says Congress can't act uh, in a bipartisan way on uh, health care issues? They'll find a way to, uh, to address that problem. But it just kind of highlights that um, squeezing down the prices alone isn't really a very effective strategy for cost control. It does nothing by itself to uh, improve quality of care. It does nothing to promote uh, coordination. In fact, it may uh, get in the way of it by providing some more incentives for, uh, for increased volume. And I think um, most importantly for where medical innovation is headed, uh, we're headed hopefully to a healthcare system that is going to rely a lot more on personalized care. So uh, knowing through genomics, information technology, uh, lots of other uh, uh, approaches to reach and communicate with patients uh, more easily in a more uh, uh, individualized way, uh, wireless technology, smartphones, and so forth, uh, hopefully getting the care that is more customized uh, and much more prevention oriented. And if you think of, of what that means for payment, um, it means that uh, instead of aiming for treatments that are, that are low cost and delivered very widely, uh, you're really looking for combinations of treatments that are much more individually tailored to a particular patient, and in that patient may be very, very valuable. So it's sort of the opposite of uh, uh, trying to hold down costs by squeezing down prices and not covering or being slow in covering new types of technologies that haven't traditionally been part of healthcare. And so that's, that fundamental is what I think is going to be driving uh, real healthcare reform and the major further steps in healthcare reform in the years ahead. And that's what I'm calling this, this alternative approach, which is focusing more on aligning needed reforms in care uh, that get the American public what they really want, better health, what they've clearly shown that they, uh, that they want to pay for and they want to see their, uh, their health care system deliver, get that aligned with our financing systems better. And to do that, uh, you really can't get there through the traditional way we've paid for health care, uh, both paid for providers and uh, on the consumer side, but the way that we've designed uh, health insurance benefits. So this is about uh, focusing on ways to reduce overall health care costs while at the same time improving outcomes. It's not doing more with less, it's doing things differently. Uh, and uh, as I said, I think it's critical for getting to more personalized preventive uh, prevention-oriented health care that involves more tailored and non-traditional types of services and better integrated care. Um, you all know that despite uh, what I described earlier as the very high average value of spending in health care, uh, there's a lot of uh, evidence of uh, what uh, economists would call a low uh, or a zero marginal value of many uh, health care expenditures. We don't do a very good job with prevention uh, in this country, with uh, even when uh, uh, preventive benefits are free. As many are in Medicare, uh, close to half the time, many beneficiaries don't get uh, very evidence-based treatments. Uh, we don't do a very good job of managing chronic diseases, uh, patients with uh, hypertension, uh, diabetes, and, and other conditions in Medicare and other good uh, insurance programs uh, are only on effective treatment uh, uh, for the long term, around 50% of the time. Uh, lots of opportunities to reduce errors and uh, uh, improve the handoffs and acute care episodes, uh, and again, Fundamentally, the, this, this move towards more patient-focused, prevention-oriented support uh, that may not even be delivered in traditional healthcare institutions, but may increasingly be delivered uh, at home uh, uh, using uh, uh, new kinds of devices that, are, that have not been part of, uh, uh, of medicine. Uh, here are some, uh, it's just a, a list of some uh, uh, examples of, of how uh, healthcare uh, is, is being delivered differently, including uh, uh, I know some programs that uh, are being implemented here uh, at the, the University of Chicago which just don't fit very well with this traditional approach to care. Um, at um, Brookings, we do a number of programs uh, that try to match the, the changes in healthcare uh, payment and policy opportunities with changes in care delivery uh, that are coming from uh, many uh, uh, healthcare organizations. Um, just to, to tell you one story in this regard, I'm going to try to fit in two more uh, before I finish my remarks. Um, one of the early meetings that I had at CMS um, uh, when I went there in 2004, this is around the time of implementing Medicare Part D, was with the CEOs of a number of uh, physician group practices. They were implementing a number of steps like these to try to, uh, like, I, like what I've just been talking about, to try to improve care. So uh, they were doing email programs and phone reminders to their Medicare beneficiaries about uh, um, using preventive benefits. So they'd set up registries of their patients and were tracking uh, the ones that had not had their colonoscopies or recommended uh, mammograms or flu vaccines. Uh, uh, they had set up 
uh, in some cases, teams of providers to assist patients who had uh, uh, chronic diseases like diabetes or uh, 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 heart failure, uh, using sometimes pharmacists or, or uh, nurse practitioners to assist with medication adherence um, in a targeted way or uh, with diet and lifestyle mod modifications to reduce the, the risk factors for uh, progression of these diseases. In many cases, they had set up teams to handle uh, both uh, uh, evidence-based uh, protocols or uh, pathway-based care uh, uh, and checklists in the hospital for surgical procedures uh, and for the handoffs to the post-acute care providers uh, and making sure that there is a smooth uh, uh, medication management transition between settings of care uh, and that uh, um, uh, um, uh, re readmissions could be uh, prevented. And they had numbers to back all this up. So, you know, they'd identify some steps to improve care and lower cost. They were measuring uh, the impact of these steps. Uh, but they said, you know, look, all of these steps are working. They were showing reductions in costs, improvements in outcomes, better use of preventive services, better control of diabetes, and so forth. And they said, look, we're, we're getting killed because, you know, first of all, Medicare doesn't pay for any uh, of these services. Uh, and traditional fee for service doesn't include things like outreach to patients and uh, coordination of care and use of teams of care, including non physician uh, providers for the most part, uh, but then we're also getting killed for a second reason, which is that to the extent that these treatments actually work, we're getting reimbursed less for the stuff that Medicare does pay for, for the, uh, the hospital services, the lab tests, the imaging procedures, even the doctor's visits. You know, many of these programs were, were successful in keeping patients completely uh, at, at home. And so uh, we worked with them to set up a pilot program, which I'll talk more about in a second, that tried to align the goals that they had for, for better care for patients with accountability for the results. Uh, with what we were actually paying for, actually paying more for better care uh, at a lower cost. Um, that kind of uh, idea is what I think is sort of at the core of these alternative uh, approaches to healthcare reform that I've, I've been describing that I want to spend a little bit more time on. Uh, just a, a quick uh, note about uh, report. Um, uh, uh, Mark mentioned the, the bipartisan work that uh, we've done in this area. This is a report that, that we released from Brookings this spring that was supported by uh, people like uh, Tom Daschle, former Democratic Majority Leader, Peter Orzag, former Budget Director for President Obama, um, uh, Glenn Hubbard, uh, uh, President Bush and, and Governor Romney's Chief Economic Advisor, uh, Mike Levitt, former HHS Secretary with President Bush, uh, and a range of, uh, of health economic experts on a framework for implementing uh, these kinds of reforms throughout our health care system. So there's bipartisan support and a feasible path to get from where we are now to where we'd like to be, uh, a way of getting to lower spending growth at the same time as we're actually measuring and showing uh, that, that health outcomes for uh, the, the populations affected by all these programs are getting better. Um, and behind these ideas are really four key points uh, that, that I want to um, uh, spend the, the rest of my time on. Um, one is um, measurement and evidence. Traditionally in our healthcare system, we've done a great job of measuring the volume and intensity of services. We have very good systems for, for tracking that. Not so good systems for tracking what really matters to patients, uh, uh, the results, the outcomes, the use of the, uh, the, the best approaches to care. With better measures, it's possible to change payments in a way that aligns uh, the the results that we want to get with what we're actually paying for. And uh, while that's gotten a lot of attention, I think there's probably been less attention directed to the third uh, item here, which is benefit design and consumer engagement, uh, the same kinds of opportunities to help uh, providers uh, get more resources for supporting the kinds of care reforms that they want can apply to patients uh, as well. And, and this also has implications for insurance choice. So um, I want to tell a couple of stories along the way while I'm doing this, um, and uh, uh, we'll see how we're we're doing on time. I, by the way, I come from four generations of very fast-talking Texans, so uh, uh, I, I can keep doing this for, for quite a while. Um, uh, so uh, measuring what matters. Uh, so it's not like uh, people haven't been paying attention to quality uh, and uh, uh, value of care at all. Uh, obviously, it's been important for uh, it's important consideration for health professionals and certainly the goal of, uh, uh, of all of us involved in care, uh, but uh, it has been hard to do. So historically, a lot of the efforts to measure quality have, have started 
started with measures that can be collected from things like payment systems uh, or uh, uh, relatively low cost patient surveys. So uh, uh, did patients get treatments that you can observe in claims that look like they're uh, evidence based and effective? Uh, things like hemoglobin A1C treat testing in patients with diabetes. What were the overall costs of care? Um, uh, as care uh, measurement capabilities have gotten better uh, with more use of electronic records and the like, we've moved to the use of more clinically enhanced measures, including measures of uh, uh, not just uh, whether or not diabetic testing was done, but uh, hemoglobin A1C levels in patients with diabetes, and uh, similarly uh, proximate uh, uh, markers of, uh, of outcome risk, like uh, cholesterol levels in patients with diabetes, uh, as well as more sophisticated measures of expenditures and resource use by condition. Uh, where we're hopefully headed is towards measures that are even more closely related to what matter to patients, things like patient reported functional outcomes or uh, comprehensive view of uh, risk factors that patients have for uh, uh, developing coronary disease, uh, blood pressure, uh, um, uh, cholesterol levels, uh, uh, and so on, uh, as well as more sophisticated measures of per capita expenditure and resource use. Um, what I'd like to emphasize is that this can come from our actual healthcare system. It shouldn't be something that's an additional reporting burden for healthcare providers. And I want to do a little bit of a sideline in terms of evidence development to, to illustrate this story using uh, the issue of drug safety surveillance uh, at the FDA. Uh, FDA over the last few years, as a result of bipartisan legislation in 2007, has implemented a public-private partnership to do active surveillance of medical products. This was a uh, result of really two things. One was concern about drugs like Vioxx that are on the market for many years, used by millions of patients, uh, without uh, either being able to detect uh, clear adverse event problems quickly uh, or not being able to get to more definitive evidence on whether the, the drug was associated with uh, adverse safety events in certain populations, combined with the growing use of electronic data uh, for patient care. And the way that this program was set up was not as some big data warehouse for FDA to, to actively monitor uh, every prescription in the United States, but as a partnership with healthcare organizations, starting with health plans, but now increasingly uh, integrated health systems uh, like uh, Kaiser and uh, uh, Harvard Pilgrim in Boston, and um, uh, electronic record-based uh, uh, healthcare systems like Partners Healthcare, Duke, uh, I think Chicago may even be uh, on, on the road to uh, participating in this program as well, uh, with the idea that, that by collaborating, FDA would be able to send out queries about questions that they had about a, a possible possible drug safety problem quickly to a large number of organizations that could get answers about uh, uh, re related to those questions uh, from their own data. So uh, just to, uh, to illustrate how this works, um, the, um, the, the data that are used for patient care stay uh, in use for patient care. Those, uh, those walls with fire on them are, are our attempt, uh, attempt to, uh, to, to describe firewalls. So that's you know, pa patient uh, uh, care data within, uh, under HIPAA within those firewalls. Um, but uh, because all these organizations are working together to have sort of a basic common data model to identify which patients are using certain medications and what patients have adverse events, they can report out the relevant summary statistics. So what matters for these uh, uh, large-scale uh, evidence programs is not, you know, did Mrs. Smith uh, use a particular drug uh, last Tuesday and have an adverse event, but how many patients like Mrs. Smith were there out of the whole population of patients or large part of the population of patients uh, in the United States. And just to illustrate uh, this, this is a query that FDA ran uh, on this program in the, in the past year. They had gotten a few adverse event reports of an angiotensin two receptor blocker uh, named Omasartan uh, with uh, uh, celiac disease, which uh, as the, the health professionals in here know is uh, basically losing the lining of the gut, very serious uh, uh, adverse event. And with this system in place, FDA was able to do something they couldn't do as recently as you know, three or four years ago, and that is ask how common is this adverse event with this drug uh, in the bulk of the U.S. population. So uh, that Sentinel program that I described before now involves all the major health plans as well as major integrated health systems and a number of others, probably covers close to 150 million uh, Americans, not through a big data warehouse somewhere, but just through a collaborative participation in this uh, data sharing effort. Uh, so FDA query the system, you know, how many uh, uh, patients uh, taking Omasartan had developed celiac disease compared to those taking other similar 
heart drugs, other drugs in the ARB class for high blood pressure, and they also compared to some baseline populations. Uh, this is something that, that because of the establishment of the common data model in this network, uh, FDA could uh, get back the answers to within a few days. So uh, this is all uh, new users who met the, the criteria for uh, um, uh, use of, uh, of uh, these different ARBs. Uh, and uh, for, for celiac disease, another advantage of having distributed approach here is the, the health plans and the healthcare organizations that get the, uh, the claims data or report uh, of a serious condition like celiac disease uh, can go back and look uh, behind that data within their own health system. Uh, and they have sort of standard criteria for convert confirming uh, whether these cases were, were really there or not. And as you can see, uh, when you have you know, more than 100 million covered lives, even if these drugs are, are relatively new and used relatively rarely in the overall population, you still end up with uh, tens of thousands of cases. And um, as you can see with Olmosartan, uh, it's not, uh, there's not observed uh, celiac uh, complications or not observed at a rate out of line with other drugs in the class or with the background rate in the overall population. Uh, very helpful and timely piece of evidence. You know, this is not definitive evidence. It's still observational data. Uh, it's got a lot of imperfections for drawing causal conclusions, uh, but a very helpful piece of evidence that just wasn't possible uh, before building this kind of system up. So uh, where I see more of the measures used for improving quality, de defining what works and what doesn't, and so forth coming from is, is coming out of uh, the actual data exchange for care delivery that's happening in our healthcare system today, uh, especially with more use of electronic uh, records, and especially if health care providers and other uh, um, organizations involved in care delivery have the incentives and support for producing these kinds of measures, uh, it's possible to do a much better job of measurement uh, uh, behind, uh, 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 behind care as well. So what essentially has happened with um, medical product safety for drugs and FDA is aiming to implement the same kind of approach over the next few years for devices. Uh, is uh, being able to take out of, through this um, uh, coordinating center approach and this, this uh, uh, distributed data approach, uh, summary data from healthcare delivery from these different participating organizations about adverse events uh, with medications. And that same kind of model is now being extended in, in other areas. For example, PCORI, uh, the New Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, just awarded a large grant to a network of, uh, of, of academic centers, including uh, Chicago and others uh, that are going to implement this same kind of approach uh, for doing comparative effectiveness studies, including uh, uh, potentially uh, randomized studies as well. Um, I just would highlight up here at the top right, for, for quality measure reporting, what you'd really like to do is have the data for improving quality as close to the providers as possible. So uh, registries supporting uh, uh, um, uh, tracking patients with care, access to data from, uh, from payers like Medicare or private insurers to support providers in their efforts to improve care for patients and identify opportunities for quality improvement. That should all be about care delivery first and foremost, but in conjunction with the kinds of payment reforms I'm about to describe, reporting out from providers using common data models of uh, better measures of quality and results for their population can support the further improvements in quality on the one hand uh, and the kind of payment reforms that I'm describing on the other. So, so that, that's where I think we're headed in terms of getting uh, significant significantly better measures relevant to quality of care as well as uh, medical, uh, biomedical evidence um, at the same time as we're supporting uh, these kinds of improvements in care and the better data systems for healthcare providers uh, to use that data to, to improve care. With better measures, it's possible to reform payment. Um, I mentioned uh, that meeting that I had early on in my time at CMS with a number of uh, physician groups. Uh, the outcome of that meeting was setting up a, uh, a, a transition to a different payment system on a demonstration basis for 10 uh, healthcare organizations that were committed to these kinds of reforms in care. And we didn't um, right away replace the whole fee-for-service payment system. There was a, a lot of uncertainty that providers were facing and uh, um, an understandable reluctance uh, to, to do anything too radical in healthcare delivery, given how, uh, how, how strong uh, the, the feelings of Medicare beneficiaries are about uh, uh, making sure that their access to care isn't disrupted. So we set up a second payment track uh, for these organizations. So they still got their Part B payments for the physician services they provide. But in addition, they started tracking uh, a set of measures of 
uh, results for their patients. So things like hemoglobin A1C levels for their patients with diabetes and uh, cholesterol levels for their patients with coronary artery disease, blood pressure control for their patients with hypertension, measures of patient experience with care. And in addition to that, uh, Medicare, we also track the overall spending of these patients. And the deal was uh, that if the organizations could show improvements in most of those dimensions of quality and reductions in, and if we saw reductions in overall cost trends at the same time, they could keep most of the savings. It's the idea of shared savings or accountable care. So you're getting paid not just on the basis of how many services and how intensive services your patients receive, but also on the basis of tracking how they're doing uh, and uh, what's going on with their overall costs. Now, when these, um, these early versions of uh, what we might call accountable care organizations started, uh, they were all about um, shared savings. It was a second payment track that didn't replace the first. As more of these organizations have become more familiar with uh, the overall cost of care for their patients, they've gotten better data in, in, in terms of those slides that I showed you before of uh, the, lo the uh, longitudinal care that patients were receiving, their overall costs, their complication rates, and so forth. Uh, they've moved, in many cases, more of their payments away from the traditional fee-for-service payment track into this new accountable care payment track through models like two-sided risk and partial capitation. Uh, the advantage of that is it gives healthcare organizations more resources Resources that are not tied to the traditional way of delivering care. So if you want to set up a uh, home monitoring program using smartphones, uh, you've got more resources to do that. If you want to uh, pay for a social worker for your low-income beneficiaries who have uh, Medicare and Medicaid and, and also uh, uh, seven other uh, 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 health care problems uh, in order to man help them make sure they've got, they've got their home situation taken care of and they're getting support and adhering to their medications, you can do that. You have more resources to do that. You are accountable uh, for, for making sure that overall costs don't go up, but you have more flexibility in delivering more personalized care, more customized care to your patients. Now, there are a lot of risks, uh, understandably, in doing this. Many providers are, uh, are uncomfortable with taking on uh, these new kinds of financial risk. Uh, uh, understandably, the outcomes for patients, the results for patients, depend on a lot of other things besides the care that they're providing. Uh, it's important to know, though, that providers today under fee-for-service payment systems are also taking on a lot of risks. Every time you spend uh, extra time with a patient or uh, uh, hire, if your practice hires a nurse or someone else to help coordinate care for those patients, that, that's a financial risk. The difference is that it's one that many providers understand pretty well, so they can build into their budgets. And the, the goal of, of, of transitioning to these new kinds of accountable care payment systems is to help uh, reduce, uh, help, help change what has been uncertainty uh, about uh, dealing with these kinds of problems into more predictable risks. Uh, there also are understandable concerns about uh, uh, selection bias or patients that have serious chronic conditions not getting the care they need. All of those are reasons for uh, having a stepwise approach to moving to these new payment systems, uh, not doing, doing it just all at once. But that is happening in our uh, ACO Learning Network. We're now tracking over uh, 400 different uh, kinds of accountable care organizations across the country. And, and again, what I think these uh, approaches have in common in terms of key features of the policies that can, can drive them effectively forward are, first of all, having some common core performance measures and uh, a, a feasible pathway for improving the measures, getting to better quality measures, as I showed you on that earlier chart, having ways to share the underlying data that providers need to understand how they're performing and where the opportunities for improved performance are uh, with them in a timely way, and we still have some progress to, to make on those, with common measures and uh, uh, opportunities for rapid improvement. It should be possible to evaluate which of these payment reforms are working uh, better or not. Um, I think um, unlike uh, the way that Medicare has traditionally done demonstrations where you try to change one thing and hold everything else constant, uh, that's not the way that, that the healthcare world needs to work right now, but uh, uh, rather focus should be on uh, the overall results for the patients and getting a better understanding of how different reforms working together uh, can help uh, move there. Uh, if you think about it, uh, so-called primary care medical homes uh, are a piece of this. Uh, and what's happening there is some of the payments that primary care providers used to get on a fee-for-service basis are now going into a case-based payment associated with reporting on quality of care um, for patients. Uh, many of the uh, medical homes that we've worked with are now also part of ACOs where the primary care providers are taking on accountability for the not just process of care in their office, but the overall outcomes uh, for patients and the overall costs for patients. Uh, those tend to work best if other providers uh, move in the same direction 
direction as well. So in many specialty areas of care, different kinds of bundle payment reforms are being implemented. Uh, for example, in oncology, uh, uh, oncology medical homes shift some of the payments that uh, oncology providers get into a case-based payment that they can use to, to uh, provide treatment plans and uh, help manage complications for patients in ways that don't get paid for under fee-for-service. Again, they've got accountability for better results, uh, uh, more use of evidence-based care and the like. Similarly, for moving towards bundled payments for, say, surgical services or other types of specialty services. I've talked about ACOs already. Uh, again, all of these can reinforce each other. We're also working with a number of um, uh, drug and device manufacturers on drug and device payment systems that are not based on the volume and intensity of, uh, of products that are used, but rather uh, the impacts on patient care, uh, adherence in, uh, uh, in uh, target populations, uh, and even uh, reductions in outcomes. So for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, uh, biologics, uh, maybe a payment system that's at least in part based not on uh, how often you use the drugs and what doses was given, but on uh, what happened uh, to the patients in terms of uh, reduced hospitalizations for RA flares uh, and the like. So, so those are examples of what's happening where I, I think healthcare reform is headed in terms of the provider payment side, again, all about supporting real reforms in care delivery to get to better care and a lower cost. Before finishing, I want to spend a, a few minutes on the uh, on the patient side as well. I think this gets um, underappreciated. Um, I did talk about, uh, this was my last story, uh, about uh, Medicare Part D uh, implementation. I alluded to this earlier. Medicare as Part D was set up in a different way uh, from um, every Medicare benefit uh, up until then. Uh, as you all know, it was uh, designed to be delivered by a competing private insurance plan rather than a, uh, a single uh, a plan that would be run by the government with its own formulary and price regulation and the like. Um, uh, the result of that was uh, uh, setting up a program that had a, a fixed subsidy available that people could use to choose among uh, alternative providers. Uh, and it included a number of steps to try to address adverse selection. Uh, we included risk adjustment, reinsurance, risk corridors, uh, late enrollment penalties, as I mentioned before, uh, things that, that you know, have a lot of features in common with the uh, implementation of the ACA. Uh, the drug benefit did include a standard uh, a benefit, uh, a, a deductible followed by 25% coinsurance, followed by catastrophic coverage on the back end with that famous uh, uh, donut hole in, in the middle, you guys may remember. Back then we thought the cost was going to be higher than it turned out to be. Um, uh, do you know how many people in Part D are on that traditional benefit design today? Almost none. So uh, the, when seniors had an opportunity to choose, up, choose among plans, um, the first thing they did, understandably, was complain. So there were a lot of plan choices, very confusing. I can't tell you how, many, uh, how much time I spent in 2005 and 2006 with seniors who were just very unhappy that the government couldn't just give them a drug benefit, that they had to choose among all these different alternatives. What they did was choose plans that had relatively low premiums, that had a different kind of benefit design than traditional insurance uh, in Medicare. Uh, the way that the benefits they chose were set up was in tiers. Uh, so the most cost-effective drugs, the generics, were basically free. It may cost like a dollar uh, on their plan. Uh, the, uh, in, the, in the classes of drugs that are still the most common, uh, uh, account for most of the cost in, in outpatient prescriptions today, uh, uh, where there are competing uh, different uh, uh, drugs uh, that work in a similar way. So you know, think of like uh, uh, um, uh, oral hypoglycemic agents or, or cholesterol lowering agents or a number of drugs that, have, that work similarly for most people. Drug plans would typically negotiate with two of the manufacturers, put those drugs on a preferred tier. So those would cost like 30 bucks a month. Most everything else would be covered. In fact, now they're in many of the Part D plans, uh, four or five tiers. Uh, but the difference is, compared to a traditional insurance design, seniors get to share in a lot more of the savings when they meet their drug needs at a lower cost. So if Mrs. Smith was on a brand name beta blocker in 2005, and she signed up for one of these drug plans in 2006. Uh, she would typically get a note from her drug plan, and may also get this. Uh, her pharmacist may have brought it up to her as well. Yeah, Mrs. Smith, uh, you're on this brand name beta blocker. Uh, it's costing you $85 a month because it would be on that higher tier. Did you know that there's a generic version of exactly the same drug, regulated exactly the same way by the FDA? It would cost you a dollar. Um, so that's $84. In savings under a traditional insurance plan, you might save 15, 20 bucks, which is not trivial, but but definitely not 
uh, of the same order of magnitude. Um, we expected a lot of complaints from seniors, not just about the confusion of choosing among plans, but also about dealing with these new kinds of benefit designs for them uh, and potentially having to switch from a brand or generic, also similar things for switching from non-preferred to preferred brand name drugs. We never got many complaints about that, never at a higher rate than one per 10,000 uh, beneficiaries per month. And that's what seniors did. They overwhelmingly switched. So the use of generics among people over 65 went from about 50% in 2005 to over 80% today. And that is huge savings uh, in healthcare costs. That's not like a you know, squeeze down the prices one or 2% per year. Uh, that's, uh, that's a reduction in, say, 80% per prescription. Um, similarly, they switch from non-preferred to preferred brand name drugs, and this is one reason uh, why uh, healthcare spending growth in Part D has been uh, basically non-existent uh, over the last few years. Premiums are now running, uh, have continuously been running 40 to 50 percent below projections. That's a, a lower growth rate on this curve, uh, and uh, premiums have been flat for the last uh, uh, three years under this program. And with uh, the ACA, uh, as you all know, Medicare Part D was actually expanded to uh, to fill in uh, the donut hole. Now this could be due to, a lot of people says to you, well, you know, the way that, that um, manufacturers are developing drugs has changed. They're no longer doing Me Too drugs, they're, uh, they're focusing on drugs that meet unmet medical needs, some of which are, are very expensive and, and, and are typically targeted to, to smaller groups of patients. But that's exactly what you'd expect to happen with this change in incentives. So uh, maybe a little bit hard to so sort out causality, but it seems like it'd be awfully hard to get to this result uh, if we didn't have that level of patient engagement, uh, consumer engagement in changing changing the way that healthcare is delivered. Um, this notion of more value-based insurance design is harder to apply in other areas of healthcare, but it's coming. Uh, there are a number of uh, private employers today, like uh, Marriott, Safeway, and others, uh, that have set up similar kinds of tiered benefits or, or reference uh, pricing approaches uh, in particular areas of care, like uh, colonoscopies, where uh, they feel like they can get pretty good measures of quality, and there's also big variation in cost. So instead of paying 80% uh, of the cost, uh, uh, with some uh, unlimited cap. Uh, they're making a, a fixed contribution on behalf of their beneficiaries, along with providing beneficiaries information on the quality and cost uh, of providers of these elective services. Uh, again, you're limited in applying these approaches by the quality of the um, uh, quality measures available, the quality of the data, uh, but it is coming to other parts of healthcare. Uh, also, there's a lot of really interesting work going on now in more creative ways to engage consumers in care. This is you know, not just high deductible health plans, uh, uh, as I've said, uh, uh, tiered benefit designs uh, and uh, ways of relying on things like uh, uh, behavioral economics to uh, help uh, change behavior more. And I have to say, having worked a lot with both the uh, sort of the supply side changes like accountable care organizations and these demand side uh, uh, changes in care, care health care reform that have been driven by uh, things like Medicare Part D, um, you, you get much more powerful responses faster uh, if uh, patients are engaged and especially if you can provide uh, convincing information to them uh, and opportunities for them to, to save or, or gain uh, in terms of either health benefits or cost reductions uh, from participating. So those I think are the, the most promising approaches to, uh, uh, to health care reform. We obviously have a, a long way of go, to go for, for, to get uh, from here to there, uh, but one thing that I, I think is um, a common theme across everything I've discussed uh, is the importance of health care provider uh, engagement. Uh, if we are headed towards an era with more personalized care, more prevention-oriented care, uh, with more um, uh, direct and individualized involvement of consumers, uh, that is only going to happen through people that they trust. Uh, American public does not trust insurance companies. Uh, they do not trust the government. Uh, they trust those of you who are health care providers. And the most effective versions of all of these reforms that, that I've seen uh, around the countries are ones where health care providers have been actively involved in leading. Uh, on an ongoing basis. It's a marathon, not a sprint, of, of culture change around uh, value and around prevention, around doing what's right for patients. Uh, the challenge is getting our healthcare policies to keep up with that. Uh, I think this approach is going to win in the end for uh, uh, basically the same reason that I showed you on that first slide. The American public cares deeply, more deeply than perhaps anything else, uh, about getting the best care for themselves and their loved ones. And increasingly in the future, this is going to be the way to do it. Thank you very much for the opportunity to join me today. Thank you.
Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I think actually, Mark, one of your future seminars is going to be about uh, academic medical centers and, and health reform, so uh, I'm sure you'll have more of a chance to talk about it then. Um, one of the challenges that academic medical centers has faced is they do tend to have higher cost structures uh, because of the research involved, the teaching involved, and everything else. And I think it is going to get more difficult to continue to support those efforts as uh, healthcare payments keep getting squeezed down. Um, some of the most promising approaches that I've seen from academic centers involve uh, finding ways to, to lead on these kinds of care reforms. So uh, I think this is happening in uh, some of the programs at Chicago. I saw David Meltzer here earlier. He's involved in a uh, kind of community-based care program, which uh, is very much about changing the way that, that payments work um, for uh, uh, vulnerable populations, and especially for, for urban academic medical centers. Um, I think being in front of this movement towards accountable care payments, especially towards combining funding streams uh, with uh, social services and other approaches is happening in uh, some programs in Boston, in uh, Minnesota, uh, in Oregon. Their whole Medicaid program is now focused around uh, coordinated care organizations, including um, uh, um, uh, social services funding streams. I think all of those are very promising. But uh, I say it won't be easy, and uh, I, I, I'm you know, I'm sympathetic to the, to the challenges facing AMCs uh, in this kind of environment. Um, uh, I guess just one last point to make. I, I try to emphasize measurement uh, in my talk. It's boring stuff, but it's really the foundation for, uh, for all of these reforms. Uh, we don't have very good measures of what it is that academic centers do well, uh, sort of the, uh, the value of the training, the value of the, uh, of the breakthroughs in research, both basic and applied. And some more attention to those, I think, would help, make a, help continue to make a case for the additional costs that academic centers face. Albert. Hi, Mark. Oh, um, Albert Huang. Hi, Mark. Um, Hi. A question, uh, actually, this builds on the, the last question. Um, so one of the things that this place prides itself on is developing innovative ways of personalizing genomics, personalizing based on status, even for a disease as common as diabetes. But our quality measures that we use in the ACOs and are incredibly crude. It uses yeah. a population standard. Everyone below that counts as you know, high quality care. Um, and actually, this gets to what academic medical centers do is we provide personalization at a level beyond that. How, do you, how should we measure that? How do we reward that kind of extra effort that goes into getting the number needed to treat down to one? Right, so getting the number needed to treat down to one goes through, there, there's sort of two parts to that. One is um, the, uh, on the delivery side, it's, it's figuring out what you need to do to identify those particular subgroups of patients and uh, get them the, the best possible outcomes. On, I think, more of the, the payment side and the, 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 the healthcare financing and regulation side, it's finding the right ways of measuring that result in a generalizable way. We're not going to come up with a you know, payment system that is tailored to individual measures for each individual patient. Um, so far, like you said, we've relied a lot on hemoglobin A1C levels, which is not really uh, the thing that diabetic patients uh, care most about. And um, that's why I think further development of, of measures, and you're working on this, so uh, uh, further development of measures related to what, what does matter for those patients, whether it's uh, functional uh, outcomes or more refined versions of, uh, uh, of, of uh, replicable clinical lab measures, uh, that's the right direction. You know, the, the exact measures to use I think are going to depend on a particular clinical context, but this is an area where, um, or, where uh, academic centers like Chicago could really lead. I mean, we've been kind of stuck with um, uh, um, hemoglobin A1C levels for the last uh, uh, few years. Uh, one of the other things I do with Marshall is uh, work with the Measure Application Partnership at the National Quality Forum uh, and the, the need for, for better validated measures of, of quality of care for more patient-oriented measures of care is, is really uh, uh, a top priority there. So uh, that, that is an area where um, you know, we need some more support from academic medicine and hopefully in the next round of healthcare reform, there'll be more funding for it as well. Hard in that guidance on, on mobile apps that they issued back in September to, to say, look, we're not gonna go uh, out of our way to, to regulate uh, uh, relatively minor apps that people have on their phones now that do things like you know, track their caloric intake and things
things like uh, or track their uh, steps per day. These are things, by the way, that are being incorporated in some of the uh, models for reform care that I, that I talk about to, to try to really engage patients effectively. Um, so I think all that's moving forward. FDA does try to take a, um, a risk-based approach generally with their regulation. So basically, the, the closer these apps get to saying that um, you know if you if you uh, use this app and do this, you will have a better outcome uh, for your condition. Um, the the more that FDA is likely to regulate it, like they do uh, a, a class two or class three PMA. Um, but um, uh, from the standpoint of FDA regulation, as, as you know, I tried to illustrate in the, the Sentinel initiative, um, FDA is also trying to move towards relying more on uh, actual data. So um, one reason that the, the regulatory process can be burdensome uh, is uh, if there is a, a, a claim of important health benefit associated with a drug or device or new app, uh, and it's one that um, you know, will significantly, would be significantly affected to influence practice if a, you know, if a manufacturer is able to make it. Uh, and if there also are some risks of uh, safety problems or side effects if the app uh, or the product doesn't work as intended, well, FDA's got to go through some work and the manufacturer's got to go through some work to demonstrate that you know, the product is really effective and it's also safe, and not only in under idealized conditions of use, but to address you know, safety uh, problems that could arise in, in real world populations. With a better ability to track how patients are actually doing uh, with the, the device on an ongoing basis much faster, and that's what Sentinel's enabling uh, FDA to do around many aspects of drug safety surveillance, um, it may be possible to find a more efficient way to use these devices. So have some initial uh, testing on, on, on a product before it's approved, having more limited uh, use, what FDA's called in some of the proposals in this, in this vein, uh, special medical use, which would be in kind of a narrower population of patients where it's relatively well understood and gradually uh, expanded out from there in actual practice associated with ongoing data collection. So that's kind of the same version of kind of outcomes-oriented uh, um, uh, regulation that I described in outcomes-oriented payment. Um, so I hope that will help. But uh, um, my, you know, my view is if you're developing an app, you ought to go ahead and develop it because the, 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 for, for all the macro reasons that I talked about today, the, uh, the financial opportunities to support it I think are going to get better and better over time. I want to appreciate one more years. I mean, those factors of four and six. Yeah, it's not, it's not close, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, Bob Fogel, the Nobel Prize economist who died uh, this past year, wrote a paper a couple of years ago in which he predicted that the percent of GDP taken up by healthcare would rise to 29% by 2030, yeah. largely driven by consumer demand. Yeah. And as they talked to their politicians and representatives, this is the service they would most be asking. Just wonder if you have a comment. Well, I, I think I think Bob and a lot of the other Chicago economists who have worked on this issue are are, are right. I mean, this this is if you think about it, I mean, this is what people are willing to pay for. You get asked just about every American, you know, would you rather have today's health care at today's cost or health care from 10 or 20 years ago at, at the old cost? They, they take today's, especially for their children, their mom, the, the people that they deeply care about. But that's why I think the big challenge for health care policy is can we do a better job of, of giving uh, Americans what they really want at a lower cost? And that, that's why the, the, the leadership on these issues really, you know, has to come from, from health professionals finding and implementing these new ways of delivering care and not getting too frustrated when uh, they don't get paid for developing or using the new app or they don't get paid for uh, the extra time they're spending uh, online with their patients or for the new way that they've set up to deliver care at home, but recognize that there are some opportunities to support those reforms in care. Uh, they're, not, they're not automatic, they're not built into our payment systems yet, but for all the reasons I talked about, they're coming. They're, they're, they're pilot opportunities with uh, private plans, they're more and more uh, examples of these programs actually succeeding. So, you know, that's that's the long-term uh, challenge, really, in healthcare policy. Is we're going to get there. The American public has made clear that they want better health and they want to keep uh, supporting it. It's just a question of, of how quickly and how much resources we're going to have left over for other things. Join me again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all very much.